Welcome to the 2017 Regional Media Hall of Fame Awards. The Department of Communication at Missouri Southern uh, has honored media professionals with Hall of Fame Awards since 2006. Uh, I was actually a, a proud recipient in 2009, three years after it got going. Each of you should have a program booklet where you'll see a complete list of previous honorees and information about this year's recipients. We welcome previous honorees, and I'll have them stand, including Dow Quick, Bob Foos, and we also have a former Pioneer Broadcaster Award recipient here, Richard Massa. Please. I'd also like to take just a moment and recognize some Missouri Southern administrators joining us this evening, Vice Presidents Brad Hudson and Rob Eust. Would you stand? And finally, we have the Communication Department faculty, staff, and students, and guests joining us. Before we begin our program, uh, we have a little background about the Regional Media Hall of Fame. The awards were established in 2006 to recognize individuals who've made an impact on regional media throughout their careers. They've demonstrated the highest level of professionalism and integrity. Recipients are selected by faculty and staff in the Department of Communication based on nominations received. A display in the first floor broadcast area of Webster Hall features displays showing the short bios and pictures of each of the persons honored. We begin this evening with a presentation featuring a broadcast professional who began his television career as one of the first news anchors at our television station, KOAM. I also worked with Bob later in radio, I reminded him of uh, briefly. Bob uh, later went on to a national career before returning home to this area. Here to present the award to Bob is the current news anchor and um, news anchor and executive producer of the evening news on KOAM TV, Mr. Dow Quick. Thanks, Danny. Good evening, everybody. In uh, preparing this introduction, I got kind of a, a dose of reality, um, a bit of perspective. It occurred to me that by 1983, I was an old timer. By 1983, I had been working at KOAM TV for a little more than two years. And it's true then, it's true now. If you manage to put in more than two years in small market TV newsrooms, well, that means you um, are pretty much one of the more seasoned veterans in the department. There's a lot of turnover in this business. So in 1983, when the news director told us that a new guy was going to be joining us, well, that was nothing unusual. We always were welcoming new people. Half the people in the newsroom were new people. It was always the case. But the news director said, now, this new guy is different. He said, this new guy has even more experience than those of you who've been in the business for a couple of years. He said, this new guy had worked at our TV station, at KOAM TV, 30 years prior to that, back in 1953, when the TV station first went on the air, when the new guy was a young student at Joplin Junior College. And in fact, his uh, broadcasting experience even went back further than that because he had been an announcer at a couple of radio stations in Carthage and Joplin back when he was a student at Carthage High School starting at age 17. He went on to join KOAM at 53 actually before it went on the air and then he was there as it went on the air he had a number of responsibilities but he was best known as the very first anchor of this area's very first 10 o'clock newscast. He put in a couple of years in KOAM in the 1950s, and then he went on to accumulate a, a number of very impressive credentials. Our news director in 1983 read some of these to us. I'm going to read them to you. After leaving KOAM in mid-1950s, he went to the University of Denver. He studied uh, radio and television while also working as a news reporter for KOA radio and TV. He just told me that this is one of his dreams, in fact. Upon graduation in 1957, he joined the Navy. He was assigned to the Armed Forces Radio and Television Services at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And he was there, incidentally, during the Cuban Revolution. He had kind of a front row seat on the 
Castro takeover. Following his tour with AFTS, he worked as a news reporter and news director for radio and TV stations at a lot of different places, in Wichita, in Indianapolis, in Patterson, New Jersey, in Washington, D.C., and in New York City. And oh, by the way, while he was in Indianapolis, he was also a track announcer for the Indianapolis 500 Speedway. And while he was in D.C., he also did some contract work on the side for the government. He did voiceovers for documentaries, a number of documentaries for the Department of Agriculture and for NASA. Maybe you've heard of NASA. As a news correspondent with ABC Radio Network News and NBC Radio Network, he prepared and voiced hourly newscasts and handled global assignments, including the Iranian hostage crisis. So this is some of what was on the resume of the new guy who was about to join our TV station in 1983. At this point, most of us had not yet even met Bob Capps, and already we were intimidated by him. Within a, a week or so, uh, he arrived. He introduced himself, shook some hands, said hello with that perfect broadcaster's voice, kind of projected authority and credibility, and it didn't even matter what he said. It could just be, hi, I'm Bob, and he thought, man, this guy is good. You know, nothing fake news about this guy. His, his primary responsibility in the newsroom at that time was um, in a supervisory role. He was very generous with um, his advice for all of us who needed it, and that was all of us. He was very kind um, um, and patient with us. We knew that Bob had, had seen more than us, and that he had done more than us, and that he knew more than us, but he made it very clear from the very beginning that he was one of us. He'd roll up his sleeves, and he'd get to work, and he would help out with whatever, whatever had to be done, and that meant that if uh, a news anchor was absent, Bob could fill in on the anchor desk. If we were short-staffed with reporters, Bob could go out in the field and report. He could produce a newscast. He could grab the script paper and put it in the typewriter and pound out a script. Bob could do pretty much anything anybody in the newsroom could do. He just did it better than the rest of us. Bob was kind of the guy a lot of us hoped we could be when we grew up. This is Bob. This is circa... 1953, so I suppose he's about 19 years old, and that behind him is the very first television news set in the four-state area. Now, if the set were today, you would have monitors behind you. You have screens, monitors, TV monitors, computer screens. That's basically how we get information and entertainment today. Well, apparently in those days, they got information and entertainment from some things called books. On our set these days, the monitors are mostly window dressing. They don't really serve any real function. Bob told us that the same is true of that bookcase. That bookcase isn't real. It's actually just painted on a fabric backdrop. It looked real enough, especially to a 1950s black and white camera, except for those occasions when an engineer would walk along behind it during a newscast and the bookcase would just kind of go like this. <laughs> I always wondered what the people at home must have thought when they saw that. Probably their reception was off. They would adjust the bunny ears on their antenna or something. By 1983, um, we were very fortunate. Not only had Bob returned, but um, we had a number of people who were with our TV station who had been at the station for the entire 30-year history of the TV station up until that point. And so for the 30th anniversary broadcast, this was in December of 1983, we got some of these founding fathers together. All of these people had started in the newsroom at KOAM. By 1983, many of them were working in, in different departments, but um, they were all still at KOAM. So we got them together for this uh, special broadcast that we had that evening, and then for this photo. Um, I'm looking at this photo, and it occurred to me none of them really seemed to be happy to be there. <laughs> Glenn Harold on the end, I mean, he might be smiling under the mustache, it's hard to tell. That's Bob, who's second from your, your left to there. 
Every one of these guys, um, I was fortunate because I was there at a time when I got to know these guys and, and work with these guys, and I know what they meant not only to our TV station, but also to our industry and to uh, television in our area. You, you know, when we do newscasts today, we uh, build incrementally on whatever went before us, and usually it's propelled by technology or some other changes, but when these guys started, they didn't have that template. They're the ones who built the foundation that the rest of us just add on to today. So we're grateful to all of them. Now, in 1983, again, Bob had returned. He was at the TV station for another couple of years at that point in the 1980s. And then he moved on, and he resumed that uh, very impressive career. And I'm going to read to you um, the rest of that career. In 1985, he dabbled in politics. He became a Jasper County Commissioner from 85 to 88. From 88 to 91, he worked at Leggett and Platt in Carthage in the Human Resources Department. A lot of people uh, know Bob for his years at KKOW as an on-air personality and news person. He worked at KKOW, the radio station based in Pittsburgh, formerly KOAM Radio, from 1981 to 2002. After that, for a year or two, he was an instructor at PSU. Then he retired, but he only kind of retired because he says his hobbies included producing documentaries on regional history and on rail travel. And these days, he enjoys his classic car collection, which means that he's still a guy I would like to be when I grow up. <laughs> it is my uh, pleasure, my great honor to get to introduce to you my friend, my colleague, and the newest inductee into the Regional Media Hall of Fame, Bob Capps. Well, thank you very much. That uh, brought back a lot of memories, and uh, I think it started me thinking about, uh, did I really do that? <laughs> I uh, sincerely appreciate the recognition by the Missouri Southern State uh, University Hall of Fame. I feel honored that my efforts in a career that I enjoyed has had value for anyone thinking about going into broadcasting and communications. I was very lucky to have worked in a job that was as much an adventure as it was a job. It took me to places I'd never been before and in some cases, places I don't want to go again. So for anyone starting out, I would say maintain a healthy curiosity for the world around you, benefit from the fantastic technology of today, because I was thinking as Dow was talking back in 1953, the only thing missing from those early TV cameras was a squirrel cage and a hamster running around inside it. They were that old or they were state of the art in those days. And take advantage and learn from all others who are there, out there to help you. The information and communication business is wide open to individuals who set professional goals and then succeed in achieving them. I want to say thanks again to Missouri Southern, the Regional Media Hall of Fame, Department of Communications, Judy Stiles and her staff for this award. I think it's a nice honor. Thank you very much. Nice job. Next, Bob Mitchell award presentation. He's our second honoree. Bob has made an impact during his career in the community journalism with the Cassville Democrat newspaper as owner, editor, and publisher. Joining us tonight to present the award to Bob is the current community newspaper professional and publisher of the Cassville Democrat, Jacob Brower. Thank you all so much. Uh, I have to confess I'm a little bit overwhelmed. I'm looking through the room and I see a lot of former professors who helped me uh, become what I am today. And, I never would have uh, dreamed that 15 years later I'd be standing up here in a suit giving an induction speech. And 
if, if they're being honest with you, they'll probably tell you that they're just as surprised as I am. So uh, th this is a huge honor for me. Uh, it is my honor and my privilege tonight to induct Bob Mitchell into the Regional Media Hall of Fame. Bob's family started the Cassville Democrat in 1871. He joined the Navy where he served from 1949 to 1953, attending the Navy Journalism School in Chicago. After he was discharged from the Navy, he took a few hard-earned days off and began his longtime career at the Cassville Democrat. As the name of the newspaper implies, the Cassville Democrat was once partisan promoting Democratic Party platform. A year later, after the Democrat was formed in 1872, the Cassville Republican came into existence, starting a 112-year newspaper battle in the small town of Cassville. Over that century plus, Cassville became more Republican, more conservative. Nonetheless, in 1984, the Cassville Democrat won the newspaper war when the Republican put out its last edition. The fact that Bob was able to overcome a very partisan atmosphere and the Democrat not only survived but succeeded through that time as a testament to his hard work and his dedication in uh, doing the paper, which has since gone nonpartisan. He uh, sold the newspaper in 1995 to Mike and Lisa Schlickman, who continued to run it until my arrival in 2013. He continues to write a weekly column, which is one of the most well-read things in the paper. Bob did an excellent job of covering Berry County news and sports. Any city council meeting, school board meeting, football game, Bob was there. But it was really his community-minded nature that set him apart. Bob was chairman of the Industrial Development Corporation for 16 years. During that time, Cassville added Fasco and Justin Boot, which continues to be the top two employers in Cassville, employing about 14% of the town. He also facilitated construction of the Cassville Golf Course and was active in Rotary and the Chamber of Commerce. According to Lisa Schlickman, quote, his helping to bring so much industry to Cassville probably saved the city. Bob understood that newspapers have a role in community growth and economic development. Even though he's been retired for 22 years, Bob still fields calls when there's news going on around Cassville. A lot of times he knows what's going on before I do, which he always reminds me of. <laughs> Uh, and as happens in the newspaper business, sometimes you rub people the wrong way. But as he told Connection Magazine last year, I've got no remorse about anything. If I stepped on any toes back then, I'd step on them again. <laughs> Bob, on a personal note, I just want to thank you for all your hard work and dedication, not only to the newspaper, but to the entire Berry County community. And you've left big shoes to fill, but it is my uh, privilege to carry on your family's tradition of covering Berry County like the morning do. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Mitchell. I do want to sincerely thank MSSU for this honor. I think uh, probably it's, uh, it speaks more for Castro maybe than it does me. Uh, the things we did and uh, the things that the newspaper facilitated and, and brought about, uh, the connections that we had that, that ended up uh, being a benefit of the town is uh, a good lesson for you young people who are going into the field of journalism is to never forget your community. Uh, Always, always work on your job. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Judy Stiles and Curtis Hallmeter and Brian Marins, three young men who uh, first opened the door up for this for me and at home. They're fine young men and the university should be proud to have this type of young men on their staff. Now, I remember years ago I was president of the Missouri or Ozark Press Association, and we were meeting in the other town over east here, and uh, I got up to introduce the speaker, and, and Sue, my wife, handed me a note. And all it said was K-I-S-S. 
and being younger then, I thought, oh boy. <laughs> but uh, I was told later that it meant keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and she reminded me that tonight. Uh, Jacob and I don't agree on when the Catholic Democrats started. I, I always said I started my journalism career when my great-grandfather, Dr. John Ray, was a physician in Cashville during the Confederate of uh, the Civil War. And uh, he took his medical saddlebags off his horse, hung them on the wall, and started the Cashville Democrat. And it was in, stayed in the family for 134 years. Uh, my daughter, Shelly, could have been running it today, but she chose a career in public relations. Our, uh, our son is an Air Force colonel, retired. Bruce has, uh, is still has his head up in, in the sky with operations in outer space. My, my career, it, covered about half the world. Started in San Diego, went to Great Lakes, went to Norfolk, Virginia, where my, one of my first stories was the Missouri went aground out on Hampton Roads. And uh, <laughs> that's quite a deal. The, the Washington Post had a cartoon on the front page, had Air Force B-36s harnessed to her, pulling her out of the mud. <laughs> And we, we had a lot to overcome there. Next was down Key West, Florida with uh, Harry Truman. Uh, I was told when I left Norfolk, and it's Norfolk, not Norfolk, it's <laughs> Norfolk, uh, that I was going down with a fellow Missourian. And that was quite a, an experience on his two trips, coordinating with, between the Navy and, and the White House Press Corps. Now that, that was, that was a group, the White House press group. From there went to Pearl Harbor, Tokyo, the amphibious forces. We pulled two amphibious landings in Korea, one evacuation at Hung Nam when we got our butts kicked off. It didn't have to happen. If Harry Truman had fired MacArthur just a little bit sooner, we'd have avoided all that. And it was not a pretty sight. It was not a pretty sight. Jacob, you know, one thing that you didn't do, you didn't introduce Kara. Kara, stand up. Jacob's wife. <laughs> And I'd like to also introduce, before I forget it, Darlene Wyrman. Darlene went to work for us in 1970, and she's been the office manager ever since. <laughs> Kyle Troutman, wherever he is, is over here. Kyle's the editor of the paper. Does a fine job. We, uh, after being out in the Far East, uh, we got back to Castle and, and uh, it intended to take some time off, but two uncles were in bad health and had instead go go to uh, go right to work. The the ability to know people and to contact people and to know how they work was the, the prime mover on about four major industries for cash flow. And it, uh, it just, things fell in. We, we, we hear something here, we hear something there, and we follow up on it, and it, uh, it, it produced per tremendous values to the town. I want to say that, you know, anybody connected with journalism that's a true journalist, there is no such thing as fake news. 
I don't know, care what some people may say about it today. I wouldn't agree with, with him, probably forgot what he said. But remember this, democracy cannot succeed in darkness. Democracy cannot succeed in darkness. And thanks again, I want to give MSSU, uh, I was telling them before we started that I was here, right over here somewhere, with Governor Hearns when he broke ground from the university. Uh, he was a good friend of mine and uh, was a good, good governor his first term. Wasn't worth a damn his second. <laughs> <laughs> but let me. I, uh, <laughs> little personal history, I have a recurrence of proctor cancer. And my medication, uh, ladies, causes uh, hot flashes. <laughs> But this is always with me. <laughs> every every place I go in my in our family room, that's right there to fight these rascals off. <laughs> I could go on and on and on, and you people don't don't want to hear all that. But I want to leave you with just one thing. Thanks again. MSSU. You've honored me greatly. And well, God save the United States of America. Last year, Missouri Southern established the Legacy Award. It was a category for the Hall of Fame. The award recognizes someone who is no longer with us, but who had a distinguished career. Man, that's an expensive way to get an award. This year's honoree had a broadcast career that began in Joplin Radio and Television in the 1950s and extended to service at Missouri Southern University. Joining us for the presentation is Dr. Chad Stebbins, Director of the Institute of International Studies here at Missouri Southern. So I knew about Ron Robeson, but I didn't know a lot about his broadcasting career. So I went to the place where you usually begin your research, Wikipedia. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I went to a website called newspaperarchives.com. I have a membership to that, and there are about 8,000 U.S. newspapers online. And you can read those archived newspapers going back 100 years or so. And fortunately, the Joplin Globe is uh, a participant in new newspaperarchives.com. So I typed in Ron Robeson and also Ronald Robeson, and I came up with over 1,000 hits. And so I started reading through those, and I did learn a lot about his broadcasting career, but I learned that this was an outstanding man, an outstanding citizen of the city of Joplin. And that's really what struck me more than his broadcasting career. He was a Sunday school teacher, a Sunday school superintendent, president of the board of directors at First Community Church, a district softball commissioner, and president of the Joplin School Board, just to name a few of his activities. I also discovered that he was referred to as Ronald Runt Robeson, or just simply Runt Robeson, several hundred times. And that kind of struck me as, as unusual. I didn't remember him as being particularly small, and so I uh, reached out to his granddaughter, Vicki, and I said, was he really called Runt Robeson? And she said, oh yes. She said he was a little guy, probably the smallest on his high school basketball team at Pittsburgh High School. I think he told me he was 90 pounds. So he wasn't tall, but apparently he made up for it with speed. He was very fast and ran circles around the taller players. And then I found a 1932 article in the Joplin Globe that said, Runt Robeson has a habit of making the towering giants on the court 
look more or less like midgets in contrast with his speed and shooting ability. And it was uh, really throughout the 1930s and 1940s that he was commonly referred to as Runt Robeson. He was born January the 21st, 1911 in Pittsburgh, Kansas. He graduated from Kansas State Teachers College in 1933, receiving a Bachelor of Science degree in education with a major in physical science. After four years of coaching at Anderson High School, which we now know as McDonald County High School, he came to Joplin in 1937. He spent one year at South Junior High coaching and teaching, and then five years at North Junior High as a coach, a teacher, and athletic director. He was then hired by the YMCA in 1943 as the physical education director. It was around this time that he met Richard Massa, the recipient of our 2001 Pioneer Broadcaster Award. Richard told me, Ron was extremely active in his church, the first community church, serving in many capacities. It was as superintendent of the Sunday school that I really got to know him. He taught one of the classes I was in, and in those years I visited with him many times when he was director of the YMCA. He also chaperoned trips that the high school band or orchestra made to entertain troops at Camp Crowder, and I always tried to get in the car he was driving. In my high school years, I always looked up to him as the type of man I would hope to become. He was a role model. When I was on the staff of the Spyglass, the Joplin High School newspaper, I often went to him with an editorial I had written for his advice and approval. My family, my mother and dad, cherished the entire Robeson family. After seven years with the Joplin YMCA, Ron made a career change in 1950, going to work for radio station KSWM. KSWM had signed on the air on June 1st, 1946, becoming Joplin's second radio station. What was the first radio station? WMBH. WMBH, very good. Austin Harrison, who received our 1998 Pioneer Broadcaster Award, was the station's founder. Austin, by the way, is, is still living. He's 96 years old. He's living in Plano, Texas with his, his daughter. I found the announcement of Ron Robeson being hired by KSWN in the Joplin Globe, July 2nd, 1950. And it was a rather large ad announcing the appointment of Ronald W. Robeson uh, to the staff of radio station KSWN as Director of Programs and Public Affairs Broadcasts. Mr. Robeson is well known throughout the entire Joplin District for his fine work as the Program Secretary of the Joplin YMCA during the past seven years, and his former work as a teacher and coach in the Joplin and the Anderson, Missouri school systems. Four years later, KSWM TV went on the air on September the 26th, 1954. Later in that decade, it would change its call letters to KODE TV. Ron Robeson gave three, new three newscasts a day and did many live TV commercials. Austin Harrison has often said that Ron Robeson was his right-hand man during those early years of the radio and television stations. His most rewarding experience was doing an interview program called For Your Information, or FYI. His guests included Missouri Governor Warren Hearns, Joplin actor Bob Cummings, Missouri head football coach Dan Devine, former heavyweight champion Joe Lewis, and the actor Ronald Reagan. On July 15, 1970, after 20 years with the radio and the TV station, Ron Robeson became the first public information director at Missouri Southern. And one of his highlights was Missouri Southern winning the 1972 NAIA Division II National Championship. After six years of public information director, he took a part-time job organizing the sports, information direct, the sports information program at the college. 
And that's where I met him in, in 1979. I was the sports editor of the chart, and I went over looking for a certain piece of information. And together, we looked through all their files and archives. They had never really been organized. Uh, Ron Robeson was the first sports information director, and we spent about an hour looking for this piece of information which, which we couldn't find, but I came away with a, an even better story. I wrote a story about Ron Robeson. And I have searched and searched to find that story that I wrote nearly 40 years ago, and apparently it doesn't exist anymore, but you'll have to take my word for it. It was a very good story, uh, and I would share it with you if I could. Uh, Ron Robeson died on November the 25th, 1998, at the age of 87, but his legacy as a broadcaster and all-around good guy continues to this day. So I'm going to invite the, the Robeson family to come up and, and say a few words. We have Vicki, we have Ron Robeson Jr., and, and Tom Robeson. I would like to thank uh, the university here for recognizing my dad for this award. Dad would be very, very honored. And uh, he thought a lot of Missouri Southern. Um, you, you heard a lot about his career and, and what kind of a, uh, a man he was as far as being involved in the community and uh, uh, many other uh, areas. But it says in the bio that he was a devoted family man. And that's the way I knew him, as a family man. He was definitely a family man. Uh, my brother and sister and I often talk about what wonderful parents we had. And uh, uh, we look back on how we were raised Sometimes they seemed a little bit strict. Sometimes they seemed a little bit old-fashioned. But looking back and, and, and looking at it from that perspective, we realized they knew exactly what they were doing. Um, I'd like to close by reading a letter that my dad wrote to my brother and my sister, or, or, and my sister and myself. In 1961, he was 50 years old. He wrote this letter to all of us. And I think it kind of explains or, or will show what kind of a family man he was. It would just take a couple of minutes to read it, but at the time he wrote this letter, my uh, I was just I had just graduated from college. My uh, younger brother was just about to graduate and my sister was about a year or two behind my brother in school. And none of us went to Missouri Southern, we all went to Joplin Junior College. And then we all went to Pittsburgh and got our degrees through Kansas State College of Pittsburgh. But in this letter, it's dated May the 26th, 1961. It's addressed to Ron, Jim, and Nancy. At this time in your lives and in ours, there are a few things we would like for you to know. And lest it be forgotten, we inscribe it to you herewith. To our three wonderful children, Ron, who already has his degree, Jim, who will graduate and then be married in just a couple of weeks, and Nancy, who will complete her college work in just a year. No parents could ask for more. Three fine Christian children in good health, ready to take your place in the world. You have always made us proud and happy because of your ability and efforts. You have caused little concern except for your well-being. Surely our cup runneth over as each of you receive your college degree. This was a goal we set for you even before you were born. Now it is a reality. Because of our insistence and your desires, we hope your years of attending school will be happy memories and will pay you handsome dividends throughout your lives. 
we think the best wish we can have for you and your chosen mates is that you will have as happy a family as we have had and that your children will endear your lives as much as you have enriched our lives. This has been written because we want to say the same thing to each of you. Maybe, maybe it will keep better too in your memory book or your lock, or lock box. Perhaps it can serve occasionally as you reread it to remind you that we love you very, very much. Remember, as long as either of or both of us live and we have a home, it will always be your home. Congratulations to each of you. God bless you all your lives. With love, your parents. As I said, uh, my brother and sister and I talk um, a great deal and we reminisce a lot and we wish we could talk to them again and run some things by them and uh, I, I again thank Missouri Southern for this award and uh, I know like I said that would be very very appreciative of this thank you In addition to the Crystal Awards presented to our honorees this evening, we also have special recognition from the city of Joplin and from the state of Missouri. I'd like to ask Bob Caps, Bob Mitchell, uh, and Vicki Robeson to come back up. We're honored tonight to have uh, with us a friend of mine, happens to be the uh, mayor of the city of Joplin, Mike Cyber present a proclamation from the city. Thank you, Danny. It is truly a pleasure to uh, be with you all this evening. Uh, and, you know, being an elected official, uh, I interact with the, uh, with the media quite frequently. And I was told early on that it pays to have a good relationship with a group that has a microphone and an audience at 6 and 10 and buys ink by the barrel. So uh, it is truly a pleasure to be able, on behalf of the city of Joplin, to uh, present uh, proclamations to uh, both Bob Caps uh, and Bob Mitchell uh, for their induction into the Hall of Fame and to uh, Ron Robeson's family on his uh, Legacy Award. So on behalf of the city of Joplin, congratulations. Another friend of mine who unfortunately was planning on being here and not, so I will be the uh, surrogate stand-in for him, is the head of the Missouri U.S. Senate, also a Joplin native. I one time called him at an event, Ronnie, and I said, oh my gosh, excuse me, Senator. He says, oh no, you've known me when I was Ronnie. Uh, Senator Ron Richard. And the state has also written a proclamation from the Missouri Senate recognizing these three people. Have a bigger budget. <laughs> you for it. <laughs> there are a lot of whereases and uh, where those and all on here, but I will hand these to you and then I'm sure you want to get a photo off of that. See, if I were better at this, I might be a senator myself. <laughs> nah. Stay where you are. Stay where I am. I heard what you said about our former governor. <laughs> First four years, great. Last four years, well, I won't quote you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Before we wrap up tonight, we have a video presentation to share with you and to share with all of you. Earlier this spring, a crew from the University Relations and marketing department had the opportunity to visit with Bob Caps and Bob Mitchell. Uh, and now we'd like to share that video with you. Um, one of my first radio jobs was at KFSB, it's 1310 now. But I went to junior college and worked there. And then Channel 7 Pittsburgh signed on the air in 1953 
and I was fortunate enough to be part of that sign-on crew at Channel 7. We None of us had any experience in television except one man, and he was the program director over there, so we had to help hang the curtains, and unload the cameras and, from the crates and things like that, and uh, everything was live. We didn't have any tape or anything, so we did our commercials live. We would uh, sell farm machinery by rolling it into the studio and then doing a hide our crib notes in the machinery someplace while we were demonstrating it for the audience. Everything was live. There were several incidents, but I think I hold the record for having been the only person who drove a new car 35 miles an hour through the prop room. I kept thinking, what if this thing doesn't start after this big buildup? The commercial call for me to get into the car, start it up, drive it, make a 90 degree turn, and go out through the prop room to the back lot. So when I got in the car, I'm sitting there unconsciously pumping the accelerator, saying to myself, you know, as I'm delivering the spiel, that uh, this thing had better start or this whole thing's a wash. I hit the key saying, I'll see you at Joe Blow's dealership or whatever it was. That thing roared to life, you know, spinning the tires on the, on the floor, linoleum. <laughs> and I'm headed straight for the control room and the guys in there, their eyes are this big, you know, and they're thinking I'm coming right through the cinder blocks at them. And one of the fellas said, uh, uh, so-and-so's on the phone. He was the car dealer, they had the sponsor. And I said, uh-oh, I've, I've blown the spot. So I picked up the phone and he said, hey, Bob, do that again next week. That was really great. <laughs> and those tire marks were up there on the floor for a long time till they replaced the tiles. I got out of college in 57, went into the service, was with Armed Forces Radio and Television in Cuba. And then in 59, well, I went to Wichita. And then in 60, I was in Indianapolis. And, uh, 65, I was at Washington and from then on up to, went up to New York in 75. I uh, got to cover the Macy's fire by subway <laughs> in New York City, and that was interesting. And uh, while that was going on, it wasn't much of a fire because they clamped down on it real fast, but while I was filing a report over the phone, Jimmy Carter and Entourage were in Vienna for some kind of an international conference. And ABC had this uh, line open to Vienna. Through some mix-up of technology or equipment, <laughs> my Macy's fire story was routed to the studio at ABC just about 10 blocks away by way of Vienna. <laughs> One of the uh, Engineers in Vienna says, what's the Macy's fire doing over here on this line? This is a white line, keep it open. So the guy in tape ops took the fall for that. Wasn't my fault. <laughs>my newspaper career started in 1872 when my great-grandfather dr john ray uh, quit practicing medicine and started the castle democrat in october and uh, it came on through the family uh, for 134 years the newspaper field opened gates for me that actually made this community. The newspaper put me in a position, I thought, to really do things that, uh, that need to be done here in Cashville that uh, hadn't been done for years and years and years. I'm very appreciative of Missouri Southern to uh, present this award. It's uh, it's obviously a, a, a great honor since three people every year uh, are recipients and uh, I do appreciate the, the opportunity to receive this honor. A little round of applause for that video. By the way, nice, nice job, Missouri Southern. That was very well produced. 
Uh, the video that you just saw will be shared on the university Facebook site. It will also be uh, used in a program being produced by broadcast students about tonight's awards. On behalf of the Department of Communication at Missouri Southern State University, uh, I'd like to thank you for attending tonight's awards ceremony. We hope this, the uh, stories about tonight not only bring back memories and recognizing outstanding professionals, <clears throat> but also inspire the media students who will be working in the field. And in a day of technology changes, let me remind you of a couple things. I've been at the station 29 years, and I've seen a lot of changes. And there are those out there, the procrastinators, the prognosticators, who will tell us that newspaper is dead, and the television station world is changing so rapidly it's gone by the wayside. See, we don't need you anymore. We've got things like YouTube and the internet and all those high-tech fashion items. It's funny, just this morning, CBS Television and the ABC Television Network were both in Pittsburgh, covering this local story. One of the first times since the tornado hit Joplin. You see, the national media only flocks in and makes their appearance when it's salacious and it's hot and it's big and they're here for three days and they're gone. They didn't come back for the anniversary of the tornado or to see the rebuild. They're on to something bigger and better. But local journalists and local television are still here. Think about the day when there's no one writing or telling the local story anymore. Do we really just become one big homogenous blue ball? I think not. No. If you're in journalism today as a student, you have a great future. See, because content is king. The vehicle? Ah, oh, they change like the car of the day. I've had a lot of cars, haven't you? Well, maybe you have, but I have. But you know, the same guy drives them. Content is king. This event is made possible by the member, by a number of financial supporters. They include Ruth Culpin Foundation, the Missouri Broadcasters Association, the Missouri Press Association, the local chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Missouri Southern State University Admissions Office. Those supporters also help with another special outreach program, the Southern Media Showcase. That event in the fall involves regional high school media students in a competition and a day of presentations on campus, making sure that journalism is alive. We would like to thank the staff, the faculty, and the students of the Department of Communication for their efforts in putting together tonight's program. Also, thanks to the campus departments for supporting this event. Congratulations to the, this year's nominees to the Hall of Fame and also the Broadcast Award. And as my colleague Dal Quick would say, good night. Make it a great one. Can you tell me how you feel about being here tonight? Oh, I'm, I'm uh, elated. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great honor uh, for not only for us and the newspaper, but for our community. And we appreciate it. What would you say has been the highlight of your career? Oh my, that's a tough one. I, I don't know. Uh, probably the work we got to do with the in the community, uh, working in the industrial development and, and uh, jobs, payroll for the community, and uh, of course the activities. All of the four years in the Navy was experiences galore all over the world or half the world at least and it's just journalism is is one of those things it's uh, it's one of those things that uh, not everybody can do and not everybody does it well we've seen some of that here recently and uh, like I said up there democracy cannot succeed in darkness and the media is what provides the light for the darkness. That's true and journalism is an adventure. Is there anyone you want to thank tonight? Oh uh, well Jacob Bauer the publisher of the Democrat now uh, 
uh, he worked tirelessly on this and uh, appreciate him. Of course, my family, uh, they, uh, they've been supportive for over oh, the 53 years that we were in it. And that's about it. All right, thank you very much. You're thank you. Okay, so what prompted your interest in the broadcast field? Well, uh, it goes way back to when I was just a small kid in elementary school. I, we listened to the radio back in those days, my family did, and uh, there were all kinds of entertainment on that, that and the movies. And every once in a while the movies would show all the glamour of a microphone and the studio and people emoting and carrying on. And I was just taken by it, fascinated by it. So I heard tonight that you traveled so much during your career. What was your favorite place to work at? Well, I think I, I enjoy the climate of Denver, mm -hmm. but one of the favorite places to work was uh, probably Indianapolis, Indiana, because there was a lot of activity there from the 500 mile race. And then it was the capital of the state and the center of the state and we had a station that covered most of the state, so we had correspondence, and anything that happened in the state from day to day was uh, very exciting, and each new day was different. So this is my last question for you. So many years later, we're still honoring you. How does that make you feel tonight, to be honored by people who look up to you in the industry? Well, it's something I never thought of, setting a mark for anybody to look up to me. And I'm very proud to have been uh, awarded this uh, award tonight. Well, from all of us here at MSSU, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And how do you feel tonight honoring your father feel, with this award? I, I just feel overwhelmed. It was something, as I said, that he would certainly uh, be honored and uh, he would say he didn't deserve it, you know. He'd be very humble. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that he was a family man. What was it like growing up in his oh, footsteps? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I have a younger brother and a younger sister, and we were all very close in age. And uh, he, he loved us very, very much. When we were little, sometimes, you know, parents do things. You think they don't know what they're doing, but, uh, and you think they're stupid, you know, and so on. That's, that's normal childhood, but we look back. And they weren't. And everything they did, they did it because they loved us. Absolutely. And the letter that I read that they sent us brought that out, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you think your father would say tonight? I don't know what he'd say. He, he would be, he would kind of, well, he was never at a loss for words. He would be honored. He would be highly honored and, and really say that he really didn't deserve it, probably. As, as I said, he'd be very humble. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.